What stops people in life is fear. Um, very few people will take fear head on because of the fear. Um, I'm, I'm scared of flying, but I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm scared of walking on a stage, but I'm not going to let it stop me. The way you learn and the way you break new ground is by screwing up and making mistakes. That is the only way I've ever learned. And every time I've done something and I get it gloriously wrong, I'm not afraid to fail. Because if I'm afraid to fail, I was never trying too hard in the first place. Well, I take fear like this, head on. Because I hate the feeling of, of, of being scared. But there's no way it's going to stop me doing what I need to do up here. People don't often understand the way hairdressers function, which is a lot from their heart and their instinct and their natural ability to just do it because that's what they do. In corporate life, you're judged in a whole different way. Not everything I do, you know, is magical. I, I, there's more things that end up in the trash can than actually sort of on film or on a stage. Whenever I fail, I always find some little chink that says, I never would have thought of that within the failure, and it takes me in a different direction. There's a lot of frustration in, in what we do. I think I, I live half my life frustrated more than, you know, fulfilled. Over the years you change and you actually don't become who you once were. And that's what I find happens to many of us. We actually evolve into some other character. I want that person back again. I want that aggression, I want that drive, I want that commitment. Where's it gone? It's gone in the car, in the house, and all the material things that surround yourself with that you think give you what you need, and it actually doesn't. What gives you what you need is what you need. And if you ask yourself, okay, what is it that I really love? And if you write down your list, you might be surprised that all those things you really love, you don't do, or you don't commit to. You do everything else, and you go, wait a minute here, I've definitely got it wrong. But it's really hard to change. You see, I think, and I really do, I think people need to suffer a little. I think suffering is good. I think people need to suffer to make the next move. Do they have the courage? Do they have, you know, somebody once said, what a new face courage puts on everything. That was Hemingway. And it does. Mm. Do they, are they inquisitive? If you're inquisitive, that's a mark. If you are inquisitive, you, it gives you the courage because you move forward. And you don't know exactly what's going to come from it. That's what's so marvelous about the art of hairdressing. You don't know what's going to come from it. You play, you work, because it isn't cerebral. Mm -hmm. It's a gut instinct. I think I've gone through times when I have been redundant of any ideas. And when I first got this, um, I used to think, oh my God, I can't do work anymore. I, I can't do hair, I can't do anything. And a panic set through me. And I think we all go through that because we reach certain peaks and then when you get to a certain peak, you can't go any further. So you have to fall down. But you have to fall down to go back up again. Now the scary thing is, is that if you're falling, you mustn't panic. And I found that now, after many years, I've experienced that and say, okay, I'm falling. Let's go with it. Let's accept the fact you're going to be this way for a couple of months or three months or even six months or even a year. The greatest reward, I think, obviously, the, the great personal rewards was the fact that my own work was recognized and became international. But I think the greatest reward was that there so many, 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 many thousands, I don't know how many, but from all over the world, have come, studied, learnt, gone back to their countries, and because of what they learned, have had a higher standard of living. I hope that we have, uh, I hope that I had something to do with raising standards, you know. Um, 
be pretty naive of me to think that I didn't. You know, I think we had a lot to do with raising standards. And I think it was the bringing of Renato who brought myself and Trevor, Tony and Guy, Irvin Rusk, Charlie Miller, John Frieda, and Sassoon's all together. And what that formulated was a group almost intent on who could do the best hair. And that created tremendous competition with us, huge. But what it did was elevate hairdressing to such a ridiculous level and we'd all be competing. And that's what I thought brought a great level of hair artistry right to the forefront. Seeing an audience stand up and applaud you. And there's people out there that know good hair when they see it. That's the biggest high for me because you can't induce that you you have to earn it and I've always said you know if if you're going to come and see Trevor Silby you're going to come and see me I roll my sleeves up and I'll show you why I'm here and I'll prove it to you and I'll live by the sword or die by it a lot of luck being there at the right time meeting Mary Quant in 57 and being in London at that moment when London was making such a noise and we were part of it. Following the Beatles into New York, you know, where you could do no wrong. And it was marvelous working with Mia. That was a, that was a Hollywood bit, a big Hollywood bit in a boxing ring, cutting her hair with the international press surrounding us. They, they were fun moments. I was doing the IBS New York 15 years ago and I was put into a part of the exhibition that you could only find it if you got lost. It was like the last booth in the entire building. But I just invented scrunch drying at the time. So I was scrunching all these hairstyles and I had this crowd of people and there was four businessmen that were watching what was happening. And at the end of the demonstration, one of them came up to me and said, can I have a word with you? And I said, yeah. He said, how would you like your name on a bottle? And I thought, yeah, why not? Just open a big fat check every month and that would do nicely. And that's how green I was about the whole thing. Anyway, I realised that it's nothing like that and it takes up probably 80% of my working days. I think the first time it came to me that other hairdressers worldwide truly wanted this was in 67. And we opened our first school because if you have something to offer, don't hide it. Give it. It only makes you stronger. Give it, work with it. And then of course the academy is open and, and, it, and it, it became international. But uh, up until that time, around about the 67th, when we, it was international already and hairdressers truly wanted to learn the systems that, that we created. No, I was having fun, I was having a marvelous time. I was doing my thing and if people liked it, fine. If they didn't, it didn't really matter. The highlight of my career, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's, it's not what anyone imagines and it's nothing to do with awards. The best moment in my life being a hairdresser on this earth for 51 years was on the 16th of August at 3 p.m. in a street called Vauxhall Bridge Road in a pub. That was the highlight of my hairdressing career. I met my wife and um, co-writer Jackie Wadeson in this pub and I was doing my book. I, my wife's idea was to compile a book for me and I agreed and I was very proud to do so. And I was in that pub that day on that time and she, my wife said to me, I've done something behind your back. So I said, who is it? And she said, no, 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 it's not, nothing like that. So she said, I've contacted 37 of the top hairdressers around the world and I've asked them if they would say a few words about you as a person and as a hairdresser. I went, did you? I said, did you get any replies? <laughs> she went, yeah, I did. She said, and here they are, and they're all on the facts. And I read them. Vidal Sassoon, Robert Laberta, Aldo Coppola, Eugene, you, and many others and I cried I've never experienced such um, and it wasn't just like oh he's a nice guy and he's a kind of okay hairdresser there, there were meaningful words thought about things and um, that is definitely the highest point 
And I, there'll never be another point higher than that, because that was my heroes. In Bond Street, there was 59 in the large salon in Bond Street. We'd moved there, we'd been there a year. And a woman came in, I'd been doing her hair, and she got married and she'd let herself go. And she came to me and said, cut my hair differently. I, what's wrong? She said, well, I think my husband's losing interest in me. And I said, I'm not gonna cut your hair differently. What I'll do is I'll send you to Weight Watchers and I'll phone Mary Quant to make something for you for three months from now. And then I'll cut your hair. And this is, this is a story that it always comes to mind because she followed it out. She started to lose weight, she started to work out, she was careful with her diet. And she'd come in and say, can you cut my hair? You're not ready. It took three months. And I called Mary one day and said, did you imagine what she was going to do? Said, she said, of course, I knew the bone structure. Are the clothes ready? Yeah. So I'm sending her in. And called Weight Watchers and thanked them. Now, I said, you're ready for this haircut. And we carved the shape because the bones were there. You could do anything you wanted. It wasn't one look. You could do anything. And we talked about it and how she'd feel about a certain look and did it. Boom. Then I thought, isn't that, that was great. That was a marvelous experience. Well, it didn't finish there. A man tapped me on the shoulder and I, are you, I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, um, oh, you looked after my wife. Yes, and I want to thank you because I lost this wife and found my old girlfriend. Wow, it really hit me. It hit me right in this, I lost this wife and found my old girlfriend. And that's what you, those kind of things aren't, it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, you know you've made a difference. I have my highs and lows, and there's times where I can't even think of anything. But I've never felt burnt out. But challenges, I've had many, and some major challenges. But it's emotional with me. I, I, I go down, you know, I, I, I sink, and I had one just, what, a year and a half ago, <clears throat> again, hospitalized through a series of, over a year period, I saw my daughter get into some bad trouble and I had to go through that with her. I met somebody and she broke my heart because uh, my, my wife and I are split. So I was looking for somebody else. I met somebody else and she broke my heart. And then my wife left the company and I didn't think that would affect me, but it did. And then something else happened, and bang, down I went. My first reaction was to go to the medicine cabinet, but fortunately there was nothing there. <clears throat> but I, I, they, put, they put me in hospital and I was sectioned, and I was in there for a month, and it was a very bad time. So there's some of the, well, one of the challenges I've had to get through but it takes a brave man to stand alone and say black is white when it's not, you know. I mean, it, but I love that spirit. Hairdressing special to me is being able to manipulate a head of hair exactly how I want it to be. In other words, I used to have these fear things in the early 70s about doing French pleats, and I could never get my hands to do it. It would, my eyes would say, okay, Rob, you've got to do this, but my hands would go and do something else. And it was like, what hands, what are you doing? You're doing it wrong again. I blame my hands, but it was in my eyes and my thought process that stopped me doing it. So as I progressed, I feel that the biggest pleasure was being able to get ahead of it and totally dominate it and control it. Energy has an enormous amount to do with it, you know. Energy creates energy, energy which creates creativity. When you're younger, all you've got is what's in front of you. You don't know any better, so you risk it. So I feel I've lost the element of risk that I once used to have, and I want that back again. In order to get that back, it's a question of unlearning everything I know and trying things out again and starting again. I would love to do that, but whether my brain permits me would be a different story.
people say to me, oh, you're very creative. I say, actually, I'm not. My answer is, I work very hard at trying to be very creative. And that's different. Robert Labetta is creative. I think that genius stroke genius is really, he can pull an idea out of nothing. I have to work very hard at getting my ideas. And that's what people don't realize. They, they just see end result. So when you see end result, times end result, times end result, you think, oh, this guy's really creative. Well, on the outside, it looks that way. But what they don't know is what it took to get there, the hard work. I disagree with Trevor. I believe that he is naturally talented. He just doesn't know it. He just thinks he has to work hard at it. I guarantee if I got hold of Trevor and said, OK, you've got one hour to do this head air. You've never seen this model. Go do it, do it. He'd make it look brilliant. So you rise to the occasion. To think of something that's different but beautiful is hard, but it's usually very simple at the same time. But the one thing that you taught me was, and when we were teaching our team over here, you used to say, stop stand back and look at it again. Because when you're so close, you know, it's so easy to just go over the top and lose sight of the whole sort of thing and the proportion and the balance. You, you, you have to know what's happening in contemporary art. Just to have an eye for art forms, because it all relates to what we do with hair, all of it. My main inspiration is that um, I, like, I like contemporary art a lot. And I think art has been the mainstay for me all my life. And I found that if I moved away from the traditional looking at fashion and looked at other areas, that it would give me something different to what anyone else has. But then I realized that there are many good things to be found just walking on the street. And then I had a camera. And then I thought, if I keep a camera with me and anything I see that's interesting, I'll take a snap of it. And then I could start to see unusual things in architecture, in streets, in people. So my eye was expanding and expanding and I saw different things and different composition in every walk of life. I've got a little antenna, ding, and it stays up. And most people, when they finish work, you go home and you turn on television and watch a soap or whatever, and most people do that. Well, I, my little antenna stays up and I can be sitting and I, t I, I Perfect example. I was walking down to my show this morning and I saw a, 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 a plant. And I'll show you after this. And it had like a stringy sort of little additions to it. And it was this thickness and this little thinness of, and this was like white and this was green. And it just was lovely sort of combination of two completely different textures, one hard and sharp, another one very soft and airy like. And that kind of got me thinking just like that. So that antenna is always up, always looking, always like never off duty. It's always something that just makes me just think. A lot of it comes from what is around me and stumbling upon and other people because I do believe that you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with good people, they're going to help you grow and they're going to push you into areas that you would never have gone before. The eye that sees shapes and angles, whether it's in a city, a building, or a hairstyle, it's the principle of shape and creating angles. We're fortuitously enough an architect will cut a shape into a city, hopefully that works with something around it. A hairdresser cuts a shape into a bone structure. And we can do it so many more times than an architect can. That's why I say we're terribly lucky to be involved in the, in the craft we're in. We're not thought of too highly in the world of hairdressing by the outside world. But I can say this really confidently because it happened to me. And this is really good for young people to listen to. I left school at the age of 15 with no exams, qualifications at all. I'm no way academic. I can't spell very well. I can't add up at all. My use of the English language is 
minimal. I lived in a, I don't know if people understand it, this in this country, but I lived in a tenement building, which is basically a bit of a slum area. We had an outside bathroom shared by the people upstairs on all floors. And I used to have a, a bath every Friday in a big tin bath with me and my brother. That's where I came from. And now I'm in charge of a multi-million pound company. Now, how the hell does that work? I ask myself. The lesson I've learned is that if you want something in life, it, it's not about Harvard Business School training. It's not about um, a silver spoon in your mouth. It's not about anything. It's about being passionate about something that you love to do, and it can give you and fulfill any and any of your wildest dreams.